Welcome back into the GSMC Sports Podcast. We just finished up talking about the American League games from yesterday. Now diving into the National League. Got a couple, I mean, specifically Brewers versus Mets was very eventful for a couple reasons. You talk about the Mets coming off of that doubleheader from yesterday. They were able to benefit from winning game one so that they could have Luis Severino pitch the game for him, for them. And ultimately, I mean, it was a fine line. It ultimately goes down as a quality start, six innings pitch. Eight hits, two walks, three earned runs, three strikeouts. Didn't feel great at the time. It definitely felt like the Brewers sort of let him off the hook in that first inning when he ran into a bunch of traffic. But, you know, he ended up allowing runners in scoring position in the first four innings, I believe it was. So definitely not clean by any means. But ultimately, he was able to get himself out of these jams pretty well all things considered and you know on the other end it's not like you got an incredible pitching performance from Freddie Peralta now obviously a lot of controversy coming with that game considering the fact that they ended up pulling Peralta after what I believe was eight consecutive um eight consecutive retired hitters you can correct me in the comment section if I'm off base on the number exact but you know Peralta got off to a little bit of a shaky start let the Mets right back into the game after the Brewers put up two in that first inning but that being said you know he sort of found his groove eventually goes four innings riding a hot streak only at 68 pitches And they decide to make the move to pull him out of the game, Pat Murphy does. And that's sort of when the floodgates open for the Mets. Now, that being said, you know, that fifth inning was going well for a good while for the Brewers. But ultimately, this Mets team just clearly doesn't know when to quit. And I say that in a good way, considering they're able to string together a couple, you know, really gutsy plays where it was Jose Iglesias who beats out the beats out the pitcher to first base as you know we're coming off of the game for Monday where it's Edwin Diaz not backing up first base and having that be costly for them seems like Iglesias from the dugout sort of learned his mental lesson of there are going to be opportunities if the pitcher doesn't cover and that's exactly what he did flies down the first base line able to get in for a single there that ends up scoring Tyrone Taylor and then from you know that place on with two outs the Mets just as resilient as they are Brandon Nimmo hits an infield single to load the bases and then you have a couple consecutive hits from Vientos and also JD Martinez coming off of the bench you know somebody who's been in big moments throughout his career especially in the playoffs they rattle off a couple hits and the Mets score five runs in that fifth inning which I believe, according to an ESPN graphic that they threw up at one point during the day, that it was the most runs scored with two outs in a playoff game since 1988. And that was basically where, you know, the the Brewers were done for after that point. And Mets were able to sort of cruise through the remainder of the game there. Definitely a lot of people calling out Pat Murphy for that decision to pull Peralta. Peralta, you know, they've been aggressive in terms of pulling pitchers early in the past. It's worked for them. Let me know in the comment section what your thoughts were because definitely going down as a controversial decision. But, you know, the Mets, I said this yesterday, they just feel like they have the makings of one of those Team of Destiny vibes. Now, you know, vibes can only get you so far. These players have to continue to produce, but they are up to this point. And being able to get it from a variety of different players, including going to your bench to, you know, bring in J.D. Martinez in a big moment. You have the bottom of the order and Tyrone Taylor sort of making the play. And on the Brewers side of this, I mean, it's not all doom and gloom. I don't feel great about where they're at currently, but, you know, at least if you're going to come out of this of this series with 
a moral victory. I do think, I know he had, doesn't go down as an error, but we're talking about Jackson Churio here. The fact that he was able to, it seemed like, rob Sterling Marte of a home run. And then it was on that Tyrone Taylor double immediately after to sort of begin that that fifth inning. That is a tough one for sure. And ultimately, you look at, you know, what he was able to do. I think they said that he was the youngest player in MLB history to record two hits in a playoff debut. So, you know, he clearly was ready for the moment, all things considered. I know the misplay in left field, a brutal one. But, you know, Brew Crew, it's been a good season. I'm not trying to call curtains on it just now, but not feeling optimistic about them for sure. But, you know, if if you have hope, let us know why in the comments section. Other game of the night, though, last game of the day, Braves versus the Padres, and we got an absolute masterclass from Michael King in this one where he was unbelievable. And this is where, you know, people are now sort of looking back to that Juan Soto trade, talking about who won. I think it was mutually beneficial. There's no need to sort of, you know, tally points here. But getting to see Michael King have the success that he did, I think was, you know, a real positive for not just Padres fans, but I think it was just really cool in general getting to see him have this season where he takes on a bigger role as a starter for the Padres and comes in to get the ball in game one and ultimately seven innings, five hits, zero walks, and 12 strikeouts. He is the fifth pitcher with 10 or more strikeouts, zero runs, and zero walks in a postseason game. And the Padres as a whole are the first team in MLB postseason history with 15 strikeouts and zero walks in a shutout. So, you know, this was a masterclass from the Padres pitching. Michael King was excellent. Finally, the Braves get a little bit of a breather getting away from Michael King. And in comes Jason Adam, and he was excellent as well. Does allow a hit, but ultimately three strikeouts to get out of that. And it was just sort of wraps from there. And the reality is, you look at the starting pitching matchup of Michael King to the Braves on the other side, where it was it was AJ Smith Shaver, who hasn't been in the major leagues basically the entire season, called him up from the minors because of the the struggles they're dealing with from an injuries perspective with their starting rotation. And, you know, he he was not good, objectively speaking. He got hit around, didn't last two innings for them. Really shouldn't have been all that much of a surprise at the end of the day there. But the Braves didn't lose this game because of the pitching. Now, would have been nice for them to, you know, have a more reliable front end pitcher. It's a very tough situation for Smith Chauver to come into that situation in a juiced Petco Park for, you know, the first time in years, at least in a playoff setting that is. And, you know, have the the towels swinging in his face and, you know, it seemed electric in that in the ballpark there, that that's a tough situation for him to walk into. Obviously, it would have been nice to have somebody like Chris Sale in that situation, but that's just the way that, you know, the cards were dealt for the Braves in this situation. And, you know, all things considered, the bullpen was shut down from there on out, and they were able to give you a scoreless six and two-thirds innings from a bullpen position. And it was Snitker himself who said that it they didn't lose this game because of who was pitching for them. It was about the fact that they just could not touch Michael King in this game. And ultimately, you know, it was really just the damage that was done in that first inning for the most part. I mean, what... I know the public perception of Fernando Tatis is, you know, a little bit polarizing, I guess would be the right word for it. But I mean, when that dude 
smacks home runs to the extent that he did going 4-15. An absolute no-doubter. Like, the ball coming in on his hands and him just being able to take it to, you know, Neverland. It, it's, it's an awesome atmosphere, and it was just such a cool moment. First home run of the postseason. I don't know. I'm, I've am i definitely, from a mutual perspective, I think the Padres are a lot of fun to root for. I understand, you know, the whatever stuff on the side. Fernando Tatis is an extremely fun baseball player. That's a fact. So, you know, those two runs early on in the game are really what did the Braves in in this game and you know they get a little bit of insurance as well as the game moves along as well they get a couple rbis from kyle higashioka it was the sack fly in the second inning to build up that 3-0 lead and then higashioka again hits a solo shot in the eighth to be able to provide a little bit more padding there but i mean that i thought it was a fun game i thought that it was a really you know, resilient game for the Braves, all things considered, coming off of the doubleheader, knowing that you were down as much pitching as you were. That's a lineup that's sort of exhausted. You know, I think it's at least worth noting that Michael Harris, who everybody was sort of pinning as somebody who really, and it's not even that people were pinning, he had not performed in the postseason up until yesterday, where he hit singles in his first two at bats. Now, ultimately, that's not the stuff of legends, but. It's a it's it's a good performance, and I think that ultimately, you know, that's the type of stuff you need to see. Michael Harris been important for them in that leadoff spot this season, especially considering all of the other injuries that they've been dealing with up to this point. And you look, and you know, it was some of the other guys. I mean, three strikeouts for Ozuna, including in that eighth inning when you know maybe there was a little bit of a chink in the armor or. I think that's the phrase um but he that situation where Ozuna stepped up to the plate with Jason Adam on the mound one man on in front of him and just wasn't able to make any sort of noise where he really struck out struggled in this game Ozzy Albies you know also struck out three times there was a lot of striking out in this game of course the 15 combined from King and Adam so this was, you know, sort of all Padres, but at the same time, I don't think that it's entirely the sky is falling for the Braves where they they hung in there in terms of a pitching perspective. And that was the number one concern. Their offense also battered, but you have a number of names there that have at least been there before. And all things considered, there is a fair amount of and experience on the Padres side, not top to bottom. They're obviously, you know, kind of hired guns in some sorts where they aren't, you know, homegrown Padres players. You go out, you get Narayas, you get Manny Machado, Xander Bogart, some people that have been in the majors for a while and do have some postseason, you know, appearances. But that being said, you know, I don't think the Braves are totally dead in this one. I picked the Padres coming into it anyways, and I do feel like that's how it ends up. But, you know, going to be interesting to see how this all plays out. But let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section as we are going to be sort of shifting gears back to the NFL as we do our weekly segment talking about each team that lost, or not each team, but a handful of the you know, prominent NFL teams that lost during their week four games. We have our panic meter scale of one to 10 from how nervous fans of these teams should be following their team's loss this past weekend. So that's what we're going to be diving into next. But before we do so, we do have to take a quick break. Do not go anywhere. We will be right back. <laughs> 